another thing that that bothers me and i want you to address this is that china china gets blamed for western colonialism in africa i, I see that you know they're projecting um what they did and china is is now exploiting africa even though africa is becoming the manufacturing um position for china and china is um investing um in high speed railing um industry and all of this stuff now um that said with the united states why do you think that they're so adamant about imposing uh, or trying to break up the african chinese relations in, in the same way that they're after breaking up the russian african relations you know the funny thing is a lot of these talks about chinese debt trap and and how how chinese is uh, is debt trapping the africans a lot of those talks are coming from writers, think tankers, and politicians in Washington, in Paris, in, in Berlin, you know, all these European or American countries. You don't you don't see like elected leaders in Africa are saying, oh no, China is hurting us. China, like they're the ones who are going to Beijing to work out bilateral deals. And but essentially all these New York Times articles are saying is. All these African leaders, they don't know what's best for their own self-interest. <laughs> we, we sitting here in New York, we understand the African uh, self-interest better than you Africans do. I mean, that's just bullshit, man. That's, that's, that's bullshit. <laughs> and, 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 the, and the fact that, um, you know, and, and the, it's just gross what they're doing, trying to uh, project the, the own, their own past history of colonialism onto China. Look, China is not sailing its naval navy to african ports and and bombarding coastal towns and forcing african government to sign the deal you know the, 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 it's a bilateral deal which means any any party can walk away anytime they want any they, 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 they can engage into the trade relationship if they want it's not a it's not a, a imposed at the at the point of a gun like the way that west have done things and, 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 and look at what China is doing right now in Africa. It's building power plants. It's building infrastructure. It's building ports. It's building airports. It's building electric grid. It's, uh, and, 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 and it's also shifting um, a manufacturing. Like mm -hmm. before, the, before the civil war broke out in Ethiopia, China was shifting a lot of its manufacturing to Ethiopia. And, you know, what, what, so the question then to us and U europe is if you criticize china what are you bringing to the table mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know wh what are you doing i mean like you what they do is all what they always do is through imf and the world bank and that that they're the ones that who, who are literally debt trapping the africans mm -hmm. and, and if anything by china coming in with investment what china is offering is an alternative now the african leaders can pick and choose it's like okay imf world bank chinese loans which one do i choose and they tend to go for the Chinese loan. And there's a reason for that. I mean, it's you because you, what you are offering, like I remember, um, I think he was a president of Kenya or, or Namibia. He said, when the Europeans and the American come, they give us a lecture. And the Chinese, mm -hmm. they just they give us investment. You know, guess guess which one we will take. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 just it's it's just obvious. I mean it's Yeah, I'm not your puppet. So why Chinese talk about Germans? How we are treating us there? Chinese don't treat us like that. The man in the video is called Norbert Lamert, right? He's a former speaker or house speaker of the German Assembly, National Assembly, also called the Bundestag. So he's the former president of the Bundestag. And in this, in this instance, he was sent as an envoy to deliver a message to the Namibian president. There is in, uh, in Namibia, for example, the number of Chinese people living here in the meantime is four times as much as, for example, the German uh, community. And it's so far, it's not precisely the same what takes place all over the world. There are differences. And what I'm... Mr. Speaker, yeah. what is your problem with that? Why does it become your problem? <laughs> it looks like it's a more European problem than our problem. Yeah. You are so sorry for us. <laughs> I don't see uh, Chinese will never come and play around here as Germans don't allow to do that which Germans are doing by the way you talk about Chinese 
We allow Germans to come off our visas here. Red carpet. Our people are harassed in Germany. Even diplomatic passport holders. In Germany. And you come in here, Germans come in here, SD1. So why Chinese talk about Germans? How we are treating us there? Chinese don't treat us like that. Diplomatic passport holders. We're coming back from, from Geneva. These people were held up at the airport. Just now, last week, up in Germany. We know what we will handle our own country. Don't be sorry for us. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Every time Westerner comes, it's about Chinese. <laughs> what is the problem? Is Namibia everyone not know Chinese? Did you tell me, we tell Namibia and Chinese have overtaken Namibia? <laughs> not in my, on my watch. I told Chinese ambassador, yeah, I met your puppet. It was in press everywhere. In Southeast, respect us. That's all I would say. It shows this respect that we are children who are going to be uh, cajoled by Chinese or so. No. Chinese are coming in infrastructure all over Africa. And I saw in America, they are there. Who bailed Americans out from the financial crisis? Chinese money is there. So why <laughs> small Namibia, who fought Germans, even Germans were fighting with you. You are tough people. Now Chinese should come and after our sovereignty come and decolonize us. You think so? Germans cannot succeed. Even those Germans who are here. So please, that every European coming is about Chinese. President of Ghana, Nana Akufo Addo, tells Kamala Harris that the United States is obsessed with China. Daniels, thank you for the question. Um, I don't know, there may be an obsession in America about the Chinese activities on the continent, but there's no such obsession here. About China is one of the many countries with whom Ghana is engaged in the world. Your country is one of them. Virtually all the countries of the world are friends of Ghana, and we have relations in varying degrees of intensity with all of them. I think the obsession comes from losing power to China and also seeing how the Chinese are interacting with the rest of the world and how they are becoming more favorable compared to the Western world. And look, and, and also, okay, so Biden, so Biden a couple of years ago, I think it was, um, it was 2021, uh, he proposed, he actually come up, okay, okay we are going to come up with an alternative to the China's Build and Road Initiative. And so he, he, he put up the so-called Build the World Better plan. Um, mm -hmm. and, and he promised to invest like billions, tens of billions of dollars in Africa and stuff like that. Well, it's two years later. What happened? What happened, mm -hmm. man? It's like Jerry Maguire says, show me the money. Show me the money, <laughs> you know? Yeah. You, and, and China is bringing money to the table. U.S. is not. So talk is cheap at the end mm. of the day. And I, I want to tell the audience also, they may not know this, but under Chinese leadership um, and with South Africa, they have issued their first BRICS um, bonds in, in uh, African, South African RAND. That was done a few days ago. Um, but I want you to listen to this clip here. This is from the former Greek um, prime minister and, and finance minister and 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 he has i mean he answers these things so poignant when a, a, a reporter kept coming at him about china and africa and I, I just want you to listen to this for a second let's see if we can get it played they're in africa they're they're lending money to countries to build ports and different to, infrastructure to build what port and harbors, what's wrong with that and well because countries that need ports get ports but they're making people dependent on... I mean, I know, it's the same thing that we've done, which is no, it's horrible not. around the world. They are, they are far more humanistic than the United States ever was. <laughs> really? Welcome to Candid Africa. Truthful and unapologetic. I've been very concerned lately about China. They are now all over Africa, you know, buying things and investing over there and getting those countries dependent on them and supporting, you know, non-democratic people. And I'm just Like whom? Well. We, come, we are in a country that supports Saudi Arabia. 
Yes, that's yeah? true. Right. So, so suddenly we have a problem with, uh, you know, superpowers supporting non-democratic people? <laughs> yes. I mean, yes, I do. You know, they're, they're in Africa. They're, they're lending money to countries to build ports and different infrastructure. To build what? Port. And harbors. what's wrong with that? And, well, because... Countries that need ports get ports. But they're making people dependent on... I mean, I know, it's the same thing that we've done, which is no, it's horrible not. around the world. They are, they are far more humanistic than the United States ever was. <laughs> really? Okay. Absolutely. Great. So... Let me give, give you an okay. example. Of course they are trying... They are peddling for, in, for, for influence. Yeah. Yeah? Uh, but they are non-interventionist. Absolutely non-interventionist in a way that Europeans, the West, has never managed to fathom. When it comes to the influence of China outside its borders, I have to say, firstly, it's quite remarkable that they don't seem to have any military um, ambitions. Secondly, Africa. I'll give you an example, a specific example, Ethiopia. 2004, because it ha happened to be there, and I, I have some uh, first-person, first-hand experience of it, they went into Ethiopia, I'll tell you why they went into Ethiopia, because they suspected it was oil. Mm -hmm. Because China is a major industrial power, but it lacks primary resources. Now, instead of going into Africa with troops, colonially, destroying the country, killing people like the West has done for the last hundred years, what they did was, they went to Addis Ababa, and they said to the government, we would like, and we can see you have problem, problems with your infrastructure. We would like to build some new airports, um, upgrade your railway system, create a telephone system, and rebuild your roads. And we'll do this all, all for free. No strings attached. We don't want anything from you. And they did. Why did they do it? Because it's soft power. Because they, now, because they knew that if oil is uh, uh, discovered, and it was discovered later, then, of course, the Ethiopian government will be much more open to Chinese oil companies coming there. They have never combined their investment with imperialistic... Can you imagine if that was a German company or an American company? <laughs> That's why I'm saying I don't think you should worry. Okay, I won't. There we have it. Let us know if you liked or hated what you... That is a classic. That, that I love that clip whenever it's I love it played. Too. Before you address that, when when you address that, also address, address one of the greatest economic and cultural feats that has ever taken place in the in such a short span of time that the West leaves out as they all often talk about communist China. They leave this point out that in the span of just a few decades, China has wiped out, uh, have moved 850 million people from the level of poverty to middle class. That is the entirety of the entire European continent plus some of the United States population, and it never gets talked about. Yeah, I uh, I just want to say to in regard to the clip, the, the lady. <laughs> why is the lady worry about Africa? She should worry about her own country. There's crumbling infrastructure. People are not getting educated. And, 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 and there's rampant uh, uh, opiate crisis in the United States. I mean, that's what she should be worrying about. What the mm -hmm. hell? It's none of her business what happened in Africa. That's, that's for the Africans to deal with. You, you deal with your own problem. And Okay, now, now, now back to China. Well, in, in China, uh, I grew up, I was born in China in 1976, uh, one month after Mao died. And I grew up in China in 1980s, so I, I experienced a whole decade of 80s. So I, I have an idea of how far China have come. I, when I was born and when I grew up in, in China in 1980s, China was a very poor country. We still had rations, you know, like to buy clothes, mm -hmm. to, to, to eat. We, we need ration, government ration papers. Um, and this, you know, I was actually had the most, uh, uh, when, when in China in late 80s, actually had the most rice quota because I was a growing teenage boy in my family. And, and I remember that because I, I, there was shortage. There was like power out, outage all the time, you know, brownouts, blackouts. And, and everything is 
import everything is imported china didn't make anything china like when my my dad came to united states in 1985 as the exchange student so she, he would send money back to to help the family and then we that's when we first got our uh, a, a, a Japanese color television. Uh, it's not because we're not patriotic Chinese. <laughs> it's because China didn't produce color television in early 1980s. And, and we had Japanese refrigerator again, because again, because China only started producing its first refrigerator in 1986. Uh, you know, at that time, everything from fertilizer to transistor radio has to be imported. China was a like a classical global south country back then you was exporting rock commodities you were ex china was an oil exporter in 1980s if you know people wouldn't believe it today but china was exporting crude oil to japan but because china didn't have its refining capability so china had to import uh, a petroleum derivative product like fer chemical fertilizers because china didn't have enough refining plants in china so so china was exporting crude oil importing fertilizers you know just like like it's a kind of the classical colonial relationship mm -hmm. right like you are you are exporting resources and getting back manufactured goods and and and, and imported everything you know even transistor radio was imported from japan and and then in the in the span of the 40 years people can see that you know the difference this this is like night night and day and and this is why people and, and in the u.s people just say, oh that's because China stole our technology. It's like no, no, no. It's not not stealing because when when the West China when China opened up its market and all the Western multinational rush in to do business and Chinese government said, okay, okay, I know you want access to our labor, you want to access our market, but we we have to set down some ground rules. You have to do technology transfer. You know, as part of your price for doing business here. Now, U.S. hated that. U.S. hated that, that they have to. But this is China asserting its sovereignty. It's like, hey, we're a sovereign nation. If you come here to do business, you play by our rules. You, we know our, we, our people needs to be get trained. They need to get their skill upgraded. You are going to do that for them if you want to do business here. And this is and, and at the same time, China also send its students abroad. Like my 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 dad was uh, among the first generation of Chinese students going abroad after Cultural Revolution. And at that time, the Chinese leader Deng Xiaoping said, "You know, most of them will never come back, but that's okay. Even if twenty percent of them do come back, that's a gain for us." So 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 they act actually encourage people to go outside to gain knowledge. And bring it back, and, and it did happen. Uh, you know, like because my my dad came to he got his PhD in uh, University of Illinois at Chicago around 1990, 1991. Um, by 2000, so many of his classmates also stayed in the United States. Many of his Chinese classmates decided to stay and work in the United States. But uh, right around 2000s. Many of them have hit that glass ceiling in the corporate world, you know, <laughs> for, for a Chinese person. And, and that's when they realize if they go back to China, the sky is the limit. They can be actually be founder of companies. It can be VPs. They can be whatever they want. So all the ambitious ones then went back to China, bring all that wealth of knowledge and, and experience they have gained working in the United States and, and back. This is how China, China developed. Um, and, 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 but, 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 People don't see that as oh, these people lose their own hard work and their, their smart planning to lift themselves out of poverty. People see that, oh, they must have stole our technology. No, 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 it's not stealing. It's, tech, it's, it's, it's man, mandated tech transfer. It's all open. You know, like that's just a price of doing business in China. And, and this is how China built its uh, high-speed trains because when uh, – at that time, China wants to build high-speed trains. It didn't have the technology, um, so you welcome uh, Western companies, Japan, Germany. You know, not no United States because the U.S. doesn't have high-speed train technology. <laughs> so, so they had Judge Simons from 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 um, from from Germany. They have Bombardier from uh, Canada. They have they have J Japan, who built Shinkansen, and China let them compete against each other. And say, okay, try, we're going to give you a huge contract, right? You know, you you can see, you can you have to show us what you can do, and and the agreement is that they need to produce most of the parts in China, so they have to open factory in China, produce these parts, and 
they have to do the technology transfer to their Chinese partner companies. So 10 years later, China now make its own high speed trains. Mm -hmm. China has gained all that technological know how. Um, and, and this is all above the table, man. This is like, this is, they didn't have to steal. It's, it's like they, the, the, the Germans and Japanese are like, oh my man, we're not getting this kind of bad contract anywhere else. We want to get in, even though this might bite us in the, in the ass later, but, but this, this, the, the going is so good, <laughs> we're gonna take the deal. And, and so this is how China developed. And also about the Chinese poverty alleviation, right? And, and this is by the UN, uh just definition of extreme poverty about people living under a dollar a day right so so, so china has one point uh you know now 1.4 billion people when i lived in china in 1980s uh it's actually significantly less there was one billion people but but even when i lived in china in 1980s uh back then only 20 percent of chinese population live in the cities 80 percent of the chinese people live on the farms and 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 when what what Chinese government did is they just went ahead and built a massive uh, new cities because mm -hmm. when you move people from the farms to the city, you automatically gain a huge jump in productivity because like people are no longer in just waiting for the crops to grow. Now they're going to factories and making stuff, you know, making toys or shoes for United States. So market maybe, but eventually <laughs> they learn you know they learn skills on their job they they open their own companies they they start making uh they start going from to making toys and shoes to make laptop computers and iphones right and and and, and they, they they have step and step gain that on that uh climbing that tech tree and this is what united states is trying to stop right now this is why us is putting the semiconductor advanced semiconductor ban on china because they're afraid that china is surpassed is going to surpass them uh, in technology and for them that's unacceptable like for if people people may be confused why there's a 180 degree term of uh, attitude of us versus china because before us is perfectly fine to have chinese making shoes for them we're fine mm -hmm. with chinese making shoes or even iphones for us but suddenly they're they're making supercomputers. <laughs> they're, they're, they're they're having AI. They have like this like uh, you know they have TikTok. You know the, the, the reason TikTok is uh, is gaining um, a lot of market share is because they have a very innovative AI algorithm that figure out what makes people click. And and that's when that's alarm people. It's like what people Chinese are doing AI right now? No no no. That's we we have to cut off the advanced semiconductors so they don't advance on that front. I mean, this is the real reason uh, why the, the U.S. is waging a tech war right now, because U.S. is all about maintaining full spectrum dominance. Mm -hmm. You know, if 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 you are going to rise up, U.S. U.S. Uh, talk about often talk about, oh, we're 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 engaging open. We're, we're welcoming co free competition with China. Well, U.S. idea of free competition is a Tanya Harton's idea of, of free competition is taking a baseball bat and, and hit the knee of Nancy Kerrigan. And that's what they're trying to do to to China, Chinese tech industry right now. They're trying to kneecap the Chinese tech industry. But I don't think it's working because, uh, you know, China has built up the industrial capacity and the and the capital and the human capital i think they they, they, they will be fine in five ten years that's i um i think it's a lot of that mixed with a lot a hubris and a lot of uh well embedded racism because the those corp, those corporations that are strategically attacked by the west challenges western technology western corporations like facebook um, uh, Instagram and 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 even Samsung in South Korea. Um, that's why they went at Huawei and all of these things. I think it's strategic and not to have a non-white, non-Western nation to dominate in those fields right there. And a lot of people don't want to address that, but I, I truly believe because there's no way that you just out of the blue you're attacking the very corporations and companies that are challenging Western dominated corporations and companies that that dominate the the landscape um in information you know they want to con control uh information they want to be able to control technology they want to have china can rise so far but hey don't you rise this high because you you're next to us and i believe that's why because remember as i tell people i said they did that to japan 
as Japan um, rose in manufacturing and technology, the difference is that China invested in different spheres of um, industry that that um that the United States can't necessarily destroy. Japan was weak because it was a colony of the United States. Um, what what say you on that matter? And and before you answer that, when you answer that, do you believe that is one of the reasons why they are strategically in Africa? To, and they're mad because China is transfer doing the same thing, transferring technology and know-how to those African nations. Man, Rashi, we, we're on the same wavelength, man. I mean, that you you understood immediately. Like, I don't have to explain. Like, we, you know, we we with some with some. Um, I'm sorry, with some white <laughs> commentators, I have to kind of massage this idea into them because it doesn't occur to them. I mean, to us, it's obvious. This is why, like, the racism is obviously a factor of that kind of the, the, the supremacism, the white supremacism that, that's built in into the system. Um, uh, a few years ago, I think it was under the Trump administration, there was um, a, a U.S. official um, she's a actually African American. She made the 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 the, the, the statement that's because uh, uh, United States is a primarily Caucasian uh, institution. That's why they see the they see the the, the rise of China is is a big challenge. Um, when we think about the Soviet Union and that competition, in a way, it was a fight within the Western family. Karl Marx was a German Jew who um, developed a, you know, a philosophy that was really within the larger body of, of, um, of political thought that reaches the work that you've done, that I've been involved with, that has some tenets even within classical liberalism. Um, and so in that way, I think it was a huge fight within, um, within the Western family. And you could look at the Soviet Union, part West, part East, um, but it had some openings there that got us the Helsinki Final Act in 1975, which is, you know, it was a really important Western concept that opened the door really to undermine um, the Soviet Union, a totalitarian state on human rights principles. That's not really possible with China. This is, this is a fight with a really different civilization and a different ideology. And the United States had not had that before nor has it had an economic competitor the way that we have. The Soviet Union was a country with nuclear weapons, a huge red army, um, but a backwards economy. And that was the insight of Reagan when the intel community told him differently. He said, I just don't see the signs that it can survive a technology race with the West. Um, so in China, we have an economic competitor, we have an ideological competitor, one that really does seek um, a kind of global reach um, that many of us didn't expect a couple of decades ago. And I think it's, the, it's also striking that it's the first time that we will have a great power competitor that is not cauc Caucasian. And you I think sound all like of Huntington's those, clash of civilizations. Some of those tenants, but a little bit different. And all of those things together are a bit perplexing for the American foreign policy establishment. And um, I think we have to, you know, take the rose-colored glasses off and get real about the nature of the threat. And I think we also have to give a kind of respect for, I think, what the Chinese seek to accomplish. But I do, I do want to press you on that. I mean, the United States is not all Caucasian, right? But we're going to be majority-minority by 2050. Uh, and so it, is that even a relevant... I mean, if I think about the, the, the peoples who will, the different races and ethnicities who will make up the United States, mm -hmm. uh, Caucasians won't be a majority. So. I think it's extremely relevant because the foreign policy establishment is so narrowly defined. Um, it, it's more homogenous than probably it should be, given our own demographics. Um, and that's why I think programs like the one at ASU um, that you've partnered with are um, extremely valuable in terms of developing a new cadre of foreign policy elites. But when I look back to who we went to graduate school, who populates IR departments at the elite universities, no question it hasn't changed very much. And so, um, and look at the, the faculties of the top 20 um, IR programs and public policy schools. So I think you know, having diversity um, on all dimensions really does help you get ready for the future. And when you don't have it, 
um, I think it, it, it hurts you. And the foreign policy elite community is pretty locked up right now. She's actually speaking the truth. She was just say, say, talking about the fact, but you know, she got a lot of flack for that. And, and, and people are calling her racist. Like, no, no, she's just stating the fact. <laughs> and, 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 but she got removed because you know they, they can't have the, the black woman to speak the truth <laughs> in public flat forums. And, and but, but this is this is really what is underlying a lot of the kind of the 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 the, the, the white supremacism uh, supremacism combined with a hubris uh, combined with American exceptionalism. This is why this explains a lot about the insane U.S. foreign policy. Uh, and 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 you so it's rightly you mentioned that China is doing technology transfer in Africa. Um, you know the for example when they built the uh, Nairobi Mombasa. Uh, standard uh, standard gauge railway in Kenya. One of the term is that, that China have to train the, the the locals to operate to maintain the the the, the system. So I so eventually so they will hand over everything to the locals to operate. Mm -hmm. And and this is all this is a whole deal. This is quite different uh, from the way the West do, doing things. The West just wants you to go, uh, you know. Put the, put the ivory on the on the on the on the rail car, load it on the ships. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you for coming. And if you don't want comp or complete your quota, we'll cut your your arms and legs off, like you know what the Belgian <laughs> did in Congo. I mean, and it's so so this is it's it's kind of really ridiculous how they are. Uh, this is why I like to say the Western talk points about China, they're not talking about China. They're talking about themselves. It's like 100% projection. You know, they're, they're trying to, now they're trying to say like China is, uh, uh, is doing like um, using slave labor to grow yeah. cottons in Xinjiang. You're like, are you freaking kidding me? Are you freaking kidding me? You, you, you are like, and, and especially even today, the U.S. the whole U.S. prison system is a giant slavery right. <laughs> institution, <laughs> and, and, and how dare you? Uh, but but I mean this is uh, this is the way they are. Uh, they they can't sometimes they, there's zero lack of self re reflection um, and and self awareness when they talk about this. Uh, and, and I'm glad I'm speaking to you, man. We we understand like it's it's just so obvious to us, <laughs> you know. And as you as you spoke. The United States comprises 5% of the population of the planet Earth, yet it is responsible for 25% of the prison population, and 90% of the prison population is non-white. Um, yep. So when we talk about human rights, you have to also bring that up because um, the UN mentioned, it was mentioned in the UN, it was mentioned by several UN nations, it was brought up by China multiple times at the UN, by Russia multiple times at the UN, UN and, and, and the United States tried to silence that information from getting out. So for those of you who are listening and who will listen, these are the things that are going on.